So this one was really cool. I got to admit, you know, we, we spend so much time on the technical side of things and, and operations and this, that, and the other, but we bring in Mary O'Connor, who's a really provocative thought leader, innovative orthopedic surgeon. She's really thinking about orthopedics in a completely different light. She's thinking about at the 36,000 foot level, all of the things that affect that patient that shows up in your office, that's got type 2 diabetes with moderate obesity that shows up with osteoarthritis of, of your knee. Most of us are like, yeah, we're just going to do a total knee. She's like, no, think about all of the things that brought that patient to the room. What can we do to help prevent that? Really change the way in which we think about you know, orthopedics as not just an end game, but really about more the continuum of care. I really like this episode. I think it's really very unique. There's lessons for everyone. I know you're going to like it. Enjoy. We continue to thank our sponsor, OrthoLaser Orthopedic Laser Centers. They continue to offer MLS M8 technology for chronic and acute orthopedic pain as an alternative source to opioids and possibly even avoiding surgery. The franchises continue to spread across the country. It's an amazing opportunity for orthopedic surgeons and doctors and even medical device reps to become part of the growing technology. OrthoLaser Milwaukee and OrthoLaser Rochester just opened. We have another five in the queue. Come and join the Ortho Laser franchise family. Hashtag follow the fro. From medical media, this is the Ortho Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of the Ortho Show podcast, where we bring you the best of the best in the orthopedic world. Today is no exception. We are very excited to have Dr. Mary O'Connor, who is one of the most influential and innovative orthopedic surgeons in the U.S., as well as one of my favorite uh, topics as a healthcare entrepreneur. Mary, it's, we're thrilled to have you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Scott, thank you so much. Delighted to be here with you and your listeners. Oh, it's fantastic. So we always like to start at the beginning because I think everybody has so you know such unique stories as to how they sort of you know find their path in life. So so why medicine and and why orthopedic surgery? We know you went to Yale in 1975, but tell us about the the the, the process of how you decided that orthopedics was for you. Well, you know, Scott, that's a great question. I think a lot of athletes are naturally um, drawn to orthopedics because they have their own experience with orthopedic surgeons as athletes. And um, certainly I had that. And with athletic trainers and kind of, you know, musculoskeletal in general. Um, but really what drew me to orthopedics was my desire to, to actually help people in ways that I could see reflected in, in kind of a direct and tangible way. And as surgeons, we're fix-it people, you know, we're, we tend to be dr stronger drivers in terms of personality types. We want to identify the problem and we want to figure out the plan and we want to execute on the plan and achieve success, right? It's like winning the race, you know, I want to achieve the goal. And we can do that in orthopedics very often. And you know how um, life-changing our therapies and our treatments can be. So it's such a personally rewarding space in medicine, and it really suits my personality better because I don't know that I would have the patience, you know, to, to be in another subspecialty or enjoy that as much as I do orthopedics and musculoskeletal. So, so I kind of, you know, gravitated to orthopedics. Yeah, there's there's something really demonstrable about what we do, right? I mean, it's effectual. You literally, you have someone comes in, they have a rotator cuff, they can't lift their arm, they fix it, they go back to work, and they're so appreciative of what you've done for them. It's like if you, you know, if you're a primary care doctor and they don't call you 20 years later because you put them on hypertensive medications and you know they didn't stroke out or have a heart attack. So it's a real, it's a real hands-on feel. You're absolutely right, and uh, and it sort of uh, it just sort of wakes you up in the morning and it really gives you a sense of healing, direct healing to your patients. So it's I think we absolutely share that as well. So if I, in my research, we always try to do our research here. I think you did some rowing at Yale. Is that what the uh, athletics I was did. for you? I did. So um, 
you know, when I was younger, there were no sports for girls in high school. So I was really on the kind of the cusp, the Title IX wave. And I, I went to Yale and I started rowing at Yale. I was very successful. We had a great team. Um, I stroked our varsity eight to a national championship when I was a senior. I stroked the U.S. women's eight to a bronze medal at the world championships that year. I was on the 1980 Olympic team. Uh, and when, you know, you may remember, although people will often ask me, although I rarely talk about this, uh, you know, well, how'd you do? Did you medal? And then I say, you know, remember the Russian invasion of Afghanistan? That was those were the Olympics that we boycotted. So that, of course, was a huge disappointment, but it remains a great honor that that I made the team. Yeah, that's right. I remember that vividly. In 1980, we boycotted. That was uh, that was a major blow for for so many who had trained so hard uh, to be able to be there. So what an accomplishment for you that uh, that you made Thank the Olympic you. squad. That's fantastic. Thank you. Great. So then, so all right. So so you decide somewhere. Uh, would you take a year off, or did you hop right into medical school then? At that point, what was your decision line there? Um. Well. I actually uh, took a couple years. I had some rowing years after I graduated, two years. And then I went to medical school and wasn't sure that I was going to do orthopedics at the time, but, but gravitated towards that. And then I was accepted at Mayo Clinic Rochester for my orthopedic residency and fellowship, and then invited to go on staff at Mayo, Florida, where I was for the majority of my career. I was chair of the department there. I was on our executive team. I was the medical director for philanthropy and the medical director for the Office of Integrity and Compliance for the whole Mayo Enterprise. So I had a lot of leadership roles. And then six years ago, was recruited to Yale and Yale School of Medicine and Yale New Haven Health um, to lead the Center for Musculoskeletal Care. And then just recently, as of a couple weeks ago, I departed from Yale and academic academia, my beloved academic medicine, to um, join a startup and co-found a startup. And now I'm the chief medical officer at Voya Health. And we're just forming and getting going. And it's very exciting and a great um, professional growth opportunity for me. Yeah, well, you ran through my entire whiteboard there in about five <laughs> seconds there. I mean, you got to give me something to talk about here, Mary. We're going to go through all of those points because I, I think you have a tremendous history. I want to I want to roll the, the tape all the way back to residency because I'm curious. You know, how many women were in your orthopedic residency all four years? Let's say put them all together while you were at the Mayo. I'm curious. Uh, probably about four or five over the five years. We had a couple women. Um there were two women in my class, which was quite unusual, mainly in Masakian. We remain great friends. Um, she was in my class. Uh, and then there was a sporadic other woman in some of the other classes. Um, it was a great place to train. Um, I loved, I love Mayo. I'll always love Mayo. I, I think I carry my Mayo Clinic values with me. You know, the needs of the patient come first. Everything that I do, I try to focus on the needs of the patient and families. Um, so that was great. And we know there's a lot of opportunities for us to improve the diversity in our profession. I've been a very strong and active advocate for that throughout my career. I've done a lot of work at the on the academy level. I was chair of the Diversity Advisory Board of the Women's Health um, Issues Advisory Board. I write a quarterly column in core clinical orthopedics and related research called Equity 360, Gender, Race, and Ethnicity, uh, which has been a really fun um, experience for me because it's really like kind of writing an op-ed or so every three months where you get to talk about a topic and and share some of your personal thoughts and, and what you would ask people to embrace uh, to try and make things better. Um, so so that can be challenging at times, but it's also, it's also really good. So I, I chair a national coalition committed to musculoskeletal equity called Movement is Life. And um, that has been financially supported by Zimmer Biomet. Um, and, and I just give them the kudos, the acknowledgement that they have stepped up uh, to help us address some of these issues. We don't promote 
arthroplasty or surgery at Movement is Life. Our focus is really on how do we help people avoid what we call the vicious cycle, which I'll just briefly take you through because I think it's so important and really crystallizes everything that's going on um, in our world, in ortho, musculoskeletal, and, and, and larger, and the larger scope of medicine, and now the pandemic. So it starts like this, you have joint pain. And when you have joint pain, you stop moving, your level of physical activity decreases. And then what happens, you gain weight, because you're still eating, and that weight puts more pressure on your joint, you get more pain, and you're getting this cycle. And we know what happens then, when you're in that cycle, um, you end up with end stage osteoarthritis, and then you're coming to see the orthopedic surgeon for joint replacement. But that's not the only thing that happens, Scott, because when that individual becomes physically inactive and obese, they also develop diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, and depression. And of course, orthopedic surgeons, you know, we don't, we're not trained to really screen or address patients that are depressed or who are catastrophizers or all the other uh, kind of mental health conditions that we know adversely impact our surgical outcomes. So in that vicious cycle, everyone is at risk. I call it an equal opportunity employer, right? The affluent white male CEO can get trapped in that vicious cycle, just like the underprivileged you know, woman of color can. But we know that women and individuals of color are more likely to get trapped in that cycle. And that's because around that cycle are the social determinants of health. So if you live in a, an unsafe neighborhood, you're not going to be able to go out and exercise. There's food deserts. You know, I, it wasn't only when I started this disparity work did I even understand this concept of food deserts. It was completely foreign to me. What do you mean you can't go to a grocery store and buy fresh fruits and vegetables? Or that those fruits and vegetables are priced higher than in my neighborhood supermarket for the same supermarket chain. I mean, how can that be, right? But that's the reality. So they're more likely to get trapped in that vicious cycle because of the social determinants. And then around that, you pace, place public and private policy. And we see that play out in our orthopedic world in the bundled payment models, which where we don't have risk adjustment for patients. And so you know when that patient comes in who's got a BMI of 40, who's diabetic, who doesn't have good support services at home, if you're going to operate on them, they're going to need more resources than the person who's thin, who has great support at home, who's going to be able to be discharged to home. And so we see, you know, cherry picking and lemon dropping um, occurring, or at least pay, uh, surgeons having a perception of risk. And I could talk more about that. We just published a study from a, a poll of the ACA Surgeon American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons regarding perception of risk. Um, and then now put the pandemic around all that. And, and this is what we see. We see lots of, of bad health outcomes, patients dying, patients at risk. And at the end of the day, we are all connected. And as a society, we all end up paying the price for this. Yeah, I mean, this, that's really 36,000 feet stuff on um, there, without a doubt. I mean, population-based medicine. I mean, the average orthopedic surgeon sits in his office, patient comes in, they do an x-ray, they say you've got end-stage osteoarthritis, and they say, okay, you've tried all these things, now we're going to do a knee replacement. What you're talking about is all of those variables well, you know, prior to that event of them showing up into your office, uh, which is not really the purview of how most orthopedic surgeons think. They're just thinking, you know, I've got my, my book of patients, I'm going to take care of them preoperatively, then after the surgery, and then we'll see them back later. But what you're, what you're talking about really is going to require a team approach across multiple specialties, across, you know, the entire, the spectrum of, of the insurance model as well, right? As to how do you pay for all these things? How do you influence and change? How do you get these people to have, get out of their food deserts? What a, what, what an amazing term. I've never heard that before. So that you can affect all of those eventualities before they happen. So, it's got to be a daunting task. It is. It's very um, overwhelming at times, you know, if I stop to think about it. Uh, but, but there are things that we can do. 
you know, one of the things that I think is important for us to recognize is how we advance the conversation about health. Because when you look at what other people attribute our health and well-being to, the, the factors that, that contribute to that, direct medical care is actually a really small percentage. It's only like 11%. That's kind of, cr- in some ways, crazy. Not really. I mean, if you fracture your femur, that 11% is critical to you. But overall, 11% of our health and well-being is made up of medical care. And then we go to social and environmental factors that are somewhere around 30, 32%. And genetics is about 20%. Oh, that makes sense. You know, you're going to have more or less tendency to develop a disease based on your DNA. But by far, the biggest factor that contributes to our health and well-being is our individual behavior. So that's the highest percentage, probably around 36% or so, if I remember the numbers correctly. And so that's where we can all make a difference and we can support people. And I just, um, I'll put a shameless plug in for my TEDx talk that I just gave in November on, on being health promoters. And it's really the concept that each of us can do something to help those around us. And I didn't realize the power of this, Scott, until I actually went to Hazard, Kentucky, So in my Movement is Life work, we created a community program called Operation Change, and we focused on women who had knee pain, and they were obese, and they usually also had some other comorbidity like hypertension or diabetes. And we would bring 40 or 50 women together for an 18-week program, and it was three hours each week, an hour of didactic, an hour of some kind of easy movement, yoga, line dancing, you know, something everybody could do an hour of motivational interviewing where they broke into smaller groups to really try and understand what are their personal barriers to adopting healthier, healthy behavior change. And listen, all of us can be healthier. Okay. Like I could sleep more. I, I, I exercise. Okay. But I could still do better. You know, I mean, all of us have opportunity to do better, but these women are, are that classic patient that comes into our office with knee arthritis, obesity, and something else. And they're, you know, maybe they're depressed and they don't have necessarily a lot of resources. Some of them, some of them are, you know, what I would use the traditional term, very middle class. And I grew up in a very middle class family. Um, So here's what I learned from that. We were very successful in helping those women improve their health. And when we asked them what it was, it wasn't our education content. That was the same. They could get that lots of places. And it wasn't the movement and it wasn't even the motivational interviewing. You know what it was? It was the relationships that they formed with each other. It was was them going to these sessions because they didn't want to miss being there to support the other women and the other women to support them. Now, I'll take a step back for a second, because as orthopedic surgeons, we tend not to stay in this emotional space. We tend to be much more in the analytical uh, driver space where it's, you know, I'm going to do the operation, I do it technically well, and you should get a great result. <laughs> but, but life is really all about emotion. And we make decisions based on emotion and based on our past experiences. We think we make them based on data. And data may influence us. But part of my own kind of personal journey as as a leader and just as an individual, I've come to appreciate more and more how it's this emotional space that's so powerful. And these women just highlighted that. And they became health promoters for each other. And what a powerful concept. You know, Scott, when you're at work, you know, you could, you could say to everybody in your office, we're going to go out for 15 minutes when the weather's nice and take a walk. We're just going to go do something. I mean, you could be, you know, you could promote the health of all those people in your office that work for you. It's simple. It's easy. It's stuff we could do. You could bring in oranges instead of, you know, coffee cake, lots of little things that, that help us. So now you're getting me in trouble now because my office staff is listening. So I better be writing all this stuff down. That's for sure, Mayor. 
No, I, I think that, you know, what it's really pretty amazing. And one of the other things that I've, I've heard you talk a lot about too is, is the patient experience. And I'm a huge believer in that, right? We, we get caught up and, oh, whatever, sorry, your shoulder's not going to move for six weeks. You're going to be an induction pill. You don't see them for six weeks and then they come back and, and you start doing stuff to help them. But at the end of the day, all, all of that time when the patient's experiencing the healing process when they're not in your office, it's important to them. And that's an emotional component as well as you were talking about. So, so talk to us about what you think about what, how important is that patient experience in the process of being involved in healthcare? Oh, I think it is paramount. And I think that we, we talk about it, but we haven't put the resources towards it to really focus on that patient experience, right? Because you know, if you have a good relationship with your patient, they're, I believe they're going to do better. First of all, they'll trust you. And if they trust you, they're going to be more comfortable asking important questions. And when they have those education gaps, that's when bad things can happen. And if instead the patient goes in and they're intimidated by the surgeon or they feel the surgeon's being judgmental about them, right, they're not going to ask questions and you can't develop that rapport because this is really a partnership. We are not just technicians, right? We are physicians. We, we are there to help our patients achieve the best life that they can. And not all of our surgeries turn out the way we want them to, right? We all know that. And yet, we, you know, we should still be there supporting them. And of course, we tell them the risks. We talk about the risk of, you know, maybe their rotator cuff isn't going to heal or the risk of surgical site infection. But do you think any patient really believes they're going to have that complication before surgery? Of course not. Why would they? Then they would never, you know, have the operation. So, so we, the more connected we are with our patients, the more they'll trust us, the better they will do. And I believe the more satisfied we will be in our profession. Yeah, that's a lesson that I've learned uh, in my 25 years of practice now as well. And I, I really try to connect with my patients, you know, for the time in which we have. But, but, but as you've stated, really partnership in the process, because you're right. I mean, there are just some times you can do everything perfectly right, do the exact correct surgery for the exact correct indication, and the patient can still have a complication or an issue. And if you have that really, you know, that important relationship with them, and then you continue that relationship, even in the setting of perhaps a complication, that that's really what's special about, about the healing process and really helping your patients. So really, you know, what, really well said, said Mary. So, so I want to give some time to, you know, to your new venture. I mean, I, I think it's kind of funny. I mean, I don't know too many people that, that leave Florida to come to cold <laughs> Yale, Connecticut at that part, at that time in your career, but now you sort of figured it out. So you've moved on from Yale. Where, where are you living now? Am I allowed to ask that question? Yeah, Heather? So, yeah, go ahead. I can ask. Sure. So where gone, are you now? Well, uh, my husband's very happy. We've gone back to our Florida house. So he, he prefers Florida to Connecticut. So, um, so that's good. You know, I personally, I, I love the, the Northeast and the weather in Connecticut. And at the time, our three children were all in the Northeast and now two of them are, and one is actually back in Florida. So it, it, it was, it all just worked out so nicely. So yes, it's a big adventure. Uh, it's a startup. I have never done anything like this before. Uh, but it allows me to take the vision that I have of integrated musculoskeletal care and how do we really drive better outcomes through excellent non-operative management up front, addressing things like depression, catastrophizing nutrition, you know, the things that we know can help patients improve any kind of musculoskeletal outcome, whether they need surgery or not. And pa patients will still need surgery. Um, and, and really take that, um, hopefully to a larger audience and, and on a bigger scale, things happen slowly in traditional healthcare systems, Scott. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think what you're really trying to do is really create a, an entire new thought process as to, you know, how we're going to deal with, do, deal with orthopedics. So I, I want to read the sort of the mission statement for Voya Health that I took off the internet, and then I'll let you roll with, <laughs> with how that's going to play out. So you, you describe yourselves as a stealth mode healthcare startup on a mission to empower humanity 
to lead their healthiest life. And I don't even see the word orthopedics in there, but I think it's pretty cool. So tell us what this is all about. Well, that is what it's all about. So we just started, so we really are in stealth mode. And um, it's, it's saying, how do you create a team around a patient that's focused on musculoskeletal um, and, 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 and give them those resources like a health coach, like a nutritionist, in addition to physical therapy and your, your PA, nurse practitioner, physician level care, right? And how do you take those resources and make them easily accessible to patients through digital technology to drive their a positive experience, engagement, and better outcomes, and at lower costs. Because, you know, we know that healthcare costs continue to escalate, and the system is so broken. You know, nobody, I mean, the, the insurance companies, what do they do? They just pass on more costs to patients and families. And out-of-pocket healthcare expenses for middle America is a huge issue. And so, so, so we need to start addressing the problem. And, and that's part of what we, you know, hope to do. So, like I said, we're very early. We just started, but it's fun and um, gets, keeps me going. Well, I think the timing is really outstanding. I mean, I think one of the things that we continue to hear on the Ortho Show as we bring in experts like yourself is that, you know, anybody that thinks that we're just going to go back to business, you know, January 2020 and just turn the lights on and go take care of patients, that, that's just not going to happen. There's going to be major wholesale changes as to how we live our lives in all aspects of our lives, not just healthcare. And so the idea now of sort of being able to enter in with technology, which really has now become such a focus with telemedicine that's available now, that finally it seems like everyone's agreed is a good thing, uh, and the ability to even connect with your patients in their therapy, in their home environment. I think it's, it's wonderful how you're going to be able to tie in what you're doing with the movement is life, you know, into what you're now going to do with Voya Healthcare as well and provide that support and nutrition. I mean, what a novel concept. Now, how are you going to scale this? Who is this going to go through? And or is it going to be through insurance companies? Is it going to be through large healthcare groups? How do you see this thing opening up? Well, Scott, that's, those are great questions. We're working on our models. You know, we're just starting and more to come on that is how I would, how I would respond. But I do want to, I'll, I'll share a story that I think would be very interesting to the listeners about tele-rehab. So I had uh, brought a, a program into Yale uh, where we were using a, a product, a tele-rehabilitation product, post-op total hip and knee. And I went in and I was seeing one of my patients pre-op and she was an older woman, probably 85 or so. And I remember before I went in to see her for a pre-op visit, I was thinking, I don't know if I should talk to her about the tele-rehab because she's older and she's probably not tech savvy and, you know, maybe I shouldn't even spend the time to talk to her about it. And then I caught myself in my own personal bias, right? I was projecting, like, she's my mother. I can't even get my mom to use a cell phone, right? There's no way I could get her to use any kind of telephysical therapy. That just wouldn't happen. So then I caught myself and I said, well, Mary, that's, you're very unfair. So I go in and I say to her, you know, we have this new program after surgery and you will send you the device and it's very easy. There's an avatar. And she said to me, well, Dr. O'Connor, do you like it? This again speaks to the relationship, right? Of the patient and the physician. She said, what do you think of it? I said, I think it's fabulous. She said, then I'm going to try it. Okay. So she has her surgery. She's back for her two-week visit. She's doing great. And I ask her, how do you like it? And she says, I love it. And I said, why do you love it? Tell me why you love it. And here's what she says. She says, you know, I don't have to get dressed, put my makeup on, and have my hair done, and my house cleaned for the physical therapist to come to my house. I don't have to put my dog in another room. I can do my exercises anytime I want, how in, in my house coat. And never once had I thought about, okay, every time the physical therapist comes to this woman's house, she feels she has to be all dressed up and she has to have her house all clean. And what a burden 
a psychological burden and physical burden that puts on an immediate post-op patient. So, so, you know, that is because my own experience, right? I mean, I'm biased based on my experience in my life that I would not see her perspective. So we are not going to get away from transitioning to a certain amount of virtual medicine. It will not, we cannot do orthopedics totally virtually. We know that, right? What we don't know is what is the appropriate blend of virtual versus inpatient uh, interaction. I don't know that yet. Nobody knows that to my knowledge, um, but that's, that's part of the new work to do. Yeah. And even those appointments that, that we've always taken for granted, as you saw your busy waiting room out there and the patient would have to take, you know, leave work at noon, drive 45 minutes to the office, fill out paperwork and then sit there and then come in and be seen by the doc for 15 minutes. I mean, it's an entire afternoon of your life that was given up and it just, for whatever reason, there was not a breakthrough to understand that, you know, the technology was there for sure. We all FaceTime, we all look at our loved ones every Sunday night or whatever it is that you do. So we're used to that concept. And so, you know, how, how much easier is it now for, for certain visits? I mean, you still, as we need to be able to examine our patients, especially if we're going to be thinking about surgery, but I think you're absolutely right. The, the blend of technology into the new space and how we move forwards and then your concepts of being able to sort of bring in all of these additional players to be able to generate. I mean, I think of Michael Sook when I keep listening to you over Geisinger and his thought process about he wants to, you know, strategize on he wants he wants to bundle knee pain into a single, you know, event where you would want to control all the things that you're talking about, diet, exercise and um, and uh, and nutrition, et cetera. So it's really it's really fascinating. And uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to keep following Voya. We have to get you out of stealth mode into <laughs> into active mode so we can see what you're going to be doing. But Scott, those are coming. Those bundles are coming. So CMMI is currently working on their first non-operative bundle for back pain. And that's probably going to come out from, from uh, I was on a conference call with them a couple weeks ago in the next year. And the way they're thinking about it right now is a 12-month bundle for Medic- Medicare beneficiaries, right? Where they're, they're going to say, here's the bundle. This is what we're going to pay somebody. And all that care has to come within that bundle. And then knee pain will come next. I mean, we know it's going to happen because we know that total hip arthroplasty and total knee arthroplasty are perennially on the Medicare hit list for, you know, how can we decrease volume because of the tremendous spend. So we'll see more and more of this bundling moving into the non-surgical space. Um, and there's oper- And I'd like to see it as the opportunity for us to better align resources to drive better clinical outcomes for patients if we can approach it in that way. So you got to describe it to my mother. My mother's listening. She wants to know, what does this bundle thing mean? And so how does that affect me? My back hurts. I'm going to go to the doctor. And, and how, what's going to happen for me as the patient? So just, to, just give us a little description of that in a nice, easy way that most listeners could really sort of take away. Well, this is assuming that my thought on the bundle is the same as CMMI. So I'll give you my, we'll give you my take on sure. it. My take on it. Sure. So my take for your mother is, is she comes in and she has some low back pain, which we know is so common, right? And we say, mom, okay, here's what we're going to do. We have this program for you and we're going to focus on how we can get you better. First, without an expensive MRI. And we're going to start therapy and we're going to think about your core strength, which your mother, you know, maybe she's never even thought about that. Right. And let's look at your, let's look at your nutrition. Do we have opportunity to do more of an anti-inflammatory diet? How do you sleep? Sleep affects pain, healing, all of these things, right? All of this comes together in a more holistic way. And can we in this bundle do these lower cost, but still potentially highly effective therapies, including physical therapy, again, which if we're driving therapy through tele-rehab, you're lowering your cost because now your mom can be doing her back exercises at home on the computer, right? Even with some kind of interactive program, potentially. 
And so now she goes through two months of this program. And if she's better, she doesn't need an MRI. If she's not getting better, maybe she does need an MRI. And so you just focus on the things that a, that a lot of people will respond to so that you don't have to use the healthcare resources that some people need and they should still get, but you're just doing what I call more effective clinical triage. And so we would say to your mom, this is how we're going to approach it. And it's very, I mean, it's commonsensical. You know, if you say to patients, um, we're going to really focus on trying to get you better without an operation, but you know, if you need an operation, we've got great surgeons. We'll send you to a great surgeon. They get that. They're like, yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's what your mom would say. Now, on the provider side, the provider who's getting a lump sum payment from CMS to provide one year of care for your mother's back pain is incentivized to now offer her services that are going to help her get better and to keep her from relapsing within that year. Instead of it's just, I'm going to give you a shot, I'm going to put you on drugs, I'm going to get you out of my office, right, for the next couple months. But now if she bounces back six months later, that's not going to help you in the bundle. So, so if we take bundles in, the, in my mind in the way that they can help us align allocation of resources in a patient-positive uh, way, I think they can move us forward. The concern, of course, is that the bundles won't be appropriately restratified and, you know, we'll we'll have challenges with delivering care to more more vulnerable and needy populations, which is what we've seen in surgical bundles. So the devil's always in the details with, with these concepts. Yeah, no, very, very, very well said. And I'm sure my mother will call me tonight and she will thank you for giving such a wonderful (laughs) description. So that's fantastic. No, Mary, this has been, this has been great. This has been a very unique episode. Sometimes we get bogged down into the details of techniques and, and very specific things. This was a wonderful overview of a sort of a very novel way of thinking about orthopedics and, and how we can help our patients. So I, for one, really greatly appreciate the last 30 minutes. That was really wonderful. Scott, thank you so much. It's, I've really enjoyed it and wishing you and all the listeners out there uh, the best. And, you know, we should all do our best to um, stay safe and, you know, stay negative, right? That's, <laughs> so someone sent that to me in an email, stay safe, stay negative. And it took me a minute to realize what stay negative meant, right? Negative on COVID-19. Although, yeah. you know, most healthcare providers are now vaccinated and hopefully that will keep us all safe. So it's important that we continue to support each other because this has been really a tough year all the way around. Very tough. Yeah, we're going to come through this. I We all sense at this time that we're moving forward. So, uh, you know, again, thank you again, Mary, for spending the time with us here today. Another perfect example of how at the Ortho Show podcast, we bring you the best of the best in the <laughs> orthopedic world. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro host of the ortho show till next time.